In part one of this analysis, I presented the contention that the continent of America was not named after Amerigo Vespucci, as historical orthodoxy maintains, but in fact derived its name from a variation of the native term Amaruka, which translates land of the plume serpent. The objective now is to identify what or who this plume serpent represents. In order to do this, we need to turn to the mythology of the three great empires that once dominated the Americas, the Maya, the Aztec, and the Inca. There are many similarities between the cultures of these three civilizations, especially in relationship to their societal constructs, architecture, technological development, pagan practices, and pantheon of deities. Among the gods of the Maya, Aztec, and Inca, one entity in particular is nearly identical in all of its attributes, the great plumed or feathered serpent. To the Maya, he was Kukulkan, to the Aztec, Quetzalcoatl, to the Inca, Veracocha, and Amaru. The worship of the serpent or dragon was not exclusive to the Americas, but ubiquitous throughout the ancient world, and most often associated with heliolatry, the worship of the sun. In her enormously influential work, The Secret Doctrine, infamous occultist Madame Blavatsky elucidates. The tradition of the dragon and the sun is echoed in every part of the world, both in its civilized and semi-savage regions. It took rise in the whisperings about secret initiations among the profane, and was established universally through the once universal heliolatrous religion. There was a time when the four parts of the world were covered with a temple sacred to the sun and the dragon. But the cult is now preserved mostly in China, and the Buddhist countries. We find a. the priests assuming the name of the gods they served, b. the dragons held throughout all antiquity as the symbols of immortality and wisdom, of secret knowledge and of eternity, and c. the hierophants of Egypt, of Babylon, and India, styling themselves generally the sons of the dragon and serpents. The ancients living in the great civilizations of antiquity were not stupid. Contrary to contemporary notions, they did not literally worship the sun and the serpent, but instead the philosophy and deity they symbolized. The sun and the serpent are oftentimes depicted together in correlation with one another because they represent the same thing, one in a material sense and the other a metaphysical sense. Just as the physical sun enlightens the earth and makes telluric life possible, so the spiritual serpent enlightens mankind and guides him into eternal life. Just as the sun rises and sets anew, so the serpent sheds its skin anew, an allegory of resurrection. Above all, the sun and the serpent signify enlightenment and apotheosis, the tree of knowledge, pointing irrefutably to one notorious character. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. In the occult, the sun and the serpent, or dragon, are direct references to Satan, that serpent of old, as the Bible calls him, and Lucifer. Originating in the Latin Vulgate translation of the Bible, the name Lucifer is a derivation of the Latin term for light-bearer, resulting from the words lux, meaning light, and ferre, to bear. Thus, the sun is an appropriate symbol for Lucifer, as affirmed by renowned sovereign grand commander of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, Albert Pike. Lucifer, the light-bearer. Strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears the light 
and with its splendors intolerable, blinds feeble, sensual, or selfish souls? Doubt it not, for traditions are full of divine revelations and inspirations, and inspiration is not of one age, nor of one creed. In accordance with occultic tradition, the plumed serpent gods of the Maya, Aztec, and Inca all symbolized enlightenment, resurrection, and eternal life. Additionally, they were all associated with the dawn and the morning star, Venus, the very same analogy attributed to Lucifer in the book of Isaiah. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning! How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. The term weakened the nations in this verse does not imply that Lucifer caused the great civilizations of the world to be weak militarily, politically, or technologically, but rather morally, leading them into gross sin and rebellion against God through the shedding of blood, sexual depravity, and idolatry. But in the traditions of the occult, the influence of Lucifer in society is viewed inversely. In other words, he does not weaken the nations, but enlightens them. Ultimately, the consequences of Lucifer's enlightenment are always the same. Bloodlust, tyranny, and death. This is certainly indicative of the Maya, Aztec, and Inca, all of whom are infamous for human sacrifice. The plumed serpent deities Kukukan, Quetzalcoatl, and Veracosha were not just worshipped as distant and impersonal gods, but were actually credited with the founding of their civilizations and the intimate dissemination of secret knowledge. In fact, each of these entities is said to have lived among his people for a time, teaching them the occultic sciences and mysteries before departing over the sea. Unbeknownst to most, behind the veneers of these plumed serpents are the faces of bearded white men. Kukukan, Quetzalcoatl, and Viracocha were not only alike in serpent form, but also in human form. Though the legends concerning them are manifold and inconsistent, these plumed serpent godmen are most often described in stark contrast to their native subjects, as being tall, white-skinned with golden beards and hair, and blue or green eyes. Whereas Veracosha was said to have emerged from the depths of Lake Titicaca on the border of Peru and Bolivia, Kukukan and Quetzalcoatl came over the sea from a distant land, a land that was destroyed in a great flood. Amarumuru, the first plumed serpent priest king in the legends of the Inca, was said to have arrived by passing through a stargate called the Gateway of the Gods, from the land of the gods which had been destroyed in a great flood, bearing in his hands the mystical solar disk of their sacred temple. Like Veracosha, he too was of white complexion with blonde hair. It is precisely because the Aztec and Inca were expecting Quetzalcoatl and Veracosha to return from over the sea that the Spanish conquistadores with their Caucasian bearded faces and advanced technology were at first received and venerated as gods, a fatal mistake that would ultimately lead to the total annihilation of both civilizations. The question now arises. Who were these plumed serpent godmen that founded the Maya, Aztec, and Inca civilizations? And where did they come from? There are many speculations. To the skeptic, they are little more than the fancy of primitive myth, probably derived from contact with European missionaries who visited the Americas in the Middle Ages. Other more intrepid minds contend that they were humanoid aliens from the Pleiades star cluster and some believe that they were ascended masters from the ethereal plane, even Jesus Christ. Although I cannot say for certain exactly who they were, I believe that the origin and nature of the plume serpent godmen can be distilled from the legends concerning them. 
Similarities in their appearance and Caucasian features suggest that they are of a common, non-indigenous race, or perhaps even the same person. The antediluvian narrative of a great flood and giants appears in all of their mythos. Kukukan, Quetzalcoatl, and Amaru Muru are said to have come from a land that was destroyed by the flood. All of them founded their respective civilizations, bestowing their cultures with science and technology unknown to Europeans of the time, such as extremely accurate cosmological models and calculations impossible for human beings of the time to ascertain. All of them established a Luciferian cult based primarily on the worship of the sun and the serpent, requiring copious amounts of human blood. Aside from these clues, all of the plumed or feathered serpent deities of the Americas were associated with the wind and flight. There exist many legends among the natives of both South and North America concerning the white-bearded gods that flew through the air on disc-shaped craft. Although legends are notoriously unreliable sources of hard information, embellished with analogies and metaphors, common threads found in the narratives of widely dispersed people groups can often be traced back to substantive fact. It is my postulation that the plumed serpent does not represent a literal depiction of Maya, Aztec, and Inca deities, but a symbolic one, pointing to Lucifer, and to a secret priesthood of highly advanced beings from antediluvian descent, the sons of the dragon, as they are called in the secret doctrine the keepers and teachers of the Luciferian lie. The nature and purpose of the plume serpent cult should be of particular interest for those of us interested in Bible prophecy, since in Revelation 13 we read, they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. Contrary to popular belief, the worship of this ancient dragon is not a relic of the primitive past, but a biblical certainty of the imminent future. And it will begin anew in the land destined to usher in the Luciferian age, the land of the plumed serpent. Stay tuned for the next installment in this series. Reporting for SteveQuail.com, I'm Timothy Alberino, and that's my analysis.